So probably we can, you know, slowly uh, uh, return to our conversation. And uh, 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 on the schedule, originally, we uh, should have uh, actually four speakers, but one of them, Hans, uh, already spoke earlier. And uh, we, yeah, we therefore has have slightly more time, but I still only give each of you 20 minutes because people now, after you know, a uh, whole day conversation, must have a lot of questions and um, you know, comments. And uh, so far, we have two very intensive, you know, intellectually speaking, very intensive panels. Uh, this one, I can promise, is going to be a fun one. So why don't we start with uh, Professor Zhang Li of anthropology from UC Davis. Yeah, I have to use, uh, I'm going to show a few slides. I have to stand here. Okay. Not that tall. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I also want to uh, just uh, thank uh, Wenxing and Kevin and the Institute for putting this very stimulating uh, conference together. Uh, it has been very enjoyable. Uh, so looking at the program, uh, it seems to me that many of um, us here are concerned not only just the production um, of knowledge about China, you know, by, by us, by, you know, researchers here, but also how different forms of knowledge um, are produced by Chinese and circulated in and beyond China. So uh, it is very important uh, for us to place our inquiry uh, of knowledge production in the broader context of what I call uh, contingent global encounters through which uh, local knowledge and uh, global forces are transforming one another in a, a dialogue way. So here I, I use the term dialogic in Bakhtin's sense to really emphasize this mutually um, constitutive nature of knowledge production and circulation in which uh, previous and uh, present works, local and global ideas are brought into contact with uh, each other and also they constantly alter the meaning of each other. So today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, why and how a nascent form of psychological knowledge and the language about the self, emotions, and therapeutics is emerging in urban China. And particularly, I want to look at the interface between uh, Western-originated psychotherapy and the local culture and historical conditions. So here I'm talking about the global uh, encounter, but as you will see, um, the past history actually comes back and matters a lot. Uh, in a very uh, recent book, I don't know whether some of you have uh, read it, that was highly featured in New York Times and authors being interviewed widely. It's called The Crazy Like Us, The Globalization of the American Psyche. Uh, the writer Ethan Waters argued that globalization uh, not only homogenizes the material world, uh, but also homogenizes the way mental illness uh, is expressed and treated. So he um, depicts this very highly disturbing trend of what he calls the Americanization of um, um, knowledge of madness and emotional disorders, uh, which at the same time largely erases all these local and temporal differences. So uh, why is this uh, alarming account really act, uh, rings truth to what is taking place in the global uh, psychiatry? Uh, I think he also oversimplifies uh, the story by dumpling another very interesting process um, that's also going on within this seemingly you know, prevalent movement of homogenizing the psyche. Uh, now, drawing upon my own uh, anthropological research, this is a new research that's very different from what I uh, did before migration and housing. This is sort of turning to the interior of, uh, of, of, of people. Um, I suggest that uh, a much more complex dialogic process is taking place uh, as China encounters various forms of psych knowledge and the therapeutic practices imported from the West. Um, just to give you a little bit of background information. Now, faced with this increasingly uh, stressful and competitive life brought by uh, post mall market reforms, more and more um, urban Chinese middle class people are actually turning to um, this emerging form of professional psychological counseling to grapple with their emotional problems and distress. Um, 
a key challenge uh, facing a lot of uh, Chinese practitioners uh, here, you know, the therapists, is how to culture these important psychological models, techniques, and the language to fit their clients' needs, expectation, and cultural sensibility. Uh, so here I only have time to provide one uh, brief example to show how uh, these Chinese therapies claim an indigenous psychotherapy through the notion of fusion uh, by reinterpreting the cultural um, affinity between traditional Chinese thinking and the Western psychological theories. Um, so why is that important? You know, why do we even bother looking at this question? I, I believe that um, this bentu hua, you know, in Chinese called bentu hua process, uh, might be able to challenge uh, the story told by uh, researchers like this Ethan Water, and it might help decenter and also complicate the production of global uh, psych knowledge. So let me just turn to uh, this phenomenon of the psych fever, uh, in China. Uh, so as you know, under Mao, mental illness was heavily stigmatized and oftentimes regarded as the wrong political thinking, right? That could be somehow corrected through um, forced labor re-education camp. So as a result, research and also uh, uh, teaching of psychology and psychiatry and clinical psychology in general was largely suspended. Uh, mental and psychological health awareness, however, began to reemerge uh, in the 1980s when China began to open up to the outside world. Um, so many things happened, but uh, let me just mention a couple of them. In 2005, the state-run central TV uh, uh, station, CCTV, launched a late night show called the Psychological Consultation. Have any of you watched it? Xinli Fang Tan, no? Oh, fascinating. Uh, that actually has played a critical role uh, in popularizing psychological counseling and also reducing the uh, stigmas attached to emotional disorder. Uh, over the past uh, one decade, I think the uh, a nascent popular psych industry is also emerging in urban China. This is largely an urban phenomenon. So uh, numerous books have been you know, translated um, into Chinese and published, and Chinese writers are also writing about uh, uh, things related to sort of self-help, psychological uh, uh, health, and countless websites. If you do any search in Baidu, uh, you will see countless websites on psychological well-being and service uh, are flourishing. They're flourishing. And then popular magazines such as this one, um, uh, it's called the Psychologies Xingli, uh, are also gaining uh, readership. It's very popular, as you can see, it's, it's women, it's middle class women, white collar women. Um, international experts from North America, Europe, Japan, and Hong Kong are also frequently invited to lecture in China today on, on psychological topics. Now, the Chinese state also launched a national examination program in 2003 to certify uh, counselors and therapists. Now, this system, however, is very interesting. I don't have time to get into the detail, but it's built on a very different model, a model that I call the speedy assembly line through which young uh, urbanites of diverse occupational backgrounds can uh, finish the required training courses with, within two to three months. And then they will pass the exam, obtain their license. So theoretically, they can practice. Um, just a picture of uh, young women who just got their license, sitting there very happy. Um, by 2008, over 100,000 people were certified throughout China. But interesting, only about 30% of them, actually less than 30% of them, uh, went into practice, uh, partly because many of the uh, people seeking such help, actually, uh, for the purpose of self help and self-improvement rather than uh, professional development because guess what, it's cheaper to go through this training than going to see a counselor. So, <laughs> so how do we make sense of this emerging psych fever? Um, that's transforming the way uh, in which you know, personhood, care of self are uh, reconceived in contemporary China. Um, and how do we account for this larger political, social, and cultural implications of this very significant therapeutic shift? So, you know, one possible answer um, probably lies in the uh, breathless pace 
uh, and disruptive nature of market reforms, as a lot of people have suggested. You know, these uh, ruptures uh, have created a lot of problems in not only uh, social economic life, but also in um, the very mental and emotional life of Chinese people. Now, another explanation here um, is that in the midst of all these structural changes, uh, family ties and, and uh, uh, close-knit neighborhood relationships and work units um, that one could rely on to a certain degree in the past are also disintegrating today. Um, but I think this is only part of the story. Uh, to fully understand this new psych fever, uh, one must pay close attention to how a new language of uh, private emotions and psychological experiences is actually now being introduced to China and transforms the subjective uh, experiences of uh, uh, those people, especially urban middle classes, uh, who come to embrace this new therapeutic uh, regime. So um, I think that that part of story is uh, important too. Uh, so uh, just to give you a little bit background of this uh, project, so since uh, 2008, I um, began this new research project, and it's largely based in Kunming. Uh, and although in the future I will also travel to Beijing and Shanghai to do some research, but it's largely based in Kunming. Um, I, uh, central to my uh, project are two sets of questions here. Uh, let me just mention them. I have no time to really go into them in great detail. The first is, what's the role of culture in shaping therapeutic regimes? Um, and second, how do imported psychological notions of the self and personality theories now intersect with um, local understandings of a socially embedded personhood and also the emerging kind of neoliberal influenced uh, notions of self-management. So as you can see, we see several strands of thinking uh, converge, conflate uh, here. OK, so let me just uh, highlight here how uh, Chinese talk therapies attempt to so-called culture uh, various uh, imported psychological models uh, in order to address their clients' uh, cultural sensibility and social expectations here. Uh, the, the Chinese term ben tu hua, I, I know many of you are very familiar with that, which can be roughly translated, I, I guess, to localization or indigeni indigenization, uh, is widely used uh, Yin and beyond this psychological context. Okay, so it's not just limited to this, uh, but in other cultural contexts as well. Now, this process of fitting uh, is widely recognized by Chinese practitioners as a necessary and challenging process involving um, creative thinking, uh, a lot of experiments, and deep understanding of both Chinese and uh, Western cultural histories. Now, while a broad range of uh, psychological theories and treatment models have been introduced to China today, if you go to the West websites, there are zillions of different kinds of approaches. Uh, three of them uh, I identify are most um, popular, uh, gained the popularity. Uh, the one is the so-called the Satya family therapy. And the second is the cognitive behavior therapy, the CBT, you probably heard of that. And then the third one is the sand play theory sand play theory. Uh, they are very popular, but they are also undergoing a great deal of uh, adaptations. So in the longer version of this paper, I uh, talk about in great detail the connection between the Satya family therapy and the so-called Chinese family. Okay? And then the kind of seemingly unlikely connection between CBT, cognitive uh, behavior therapy, and the socialist the thought work. Actually, there, there's a great deal people can say about that, but I don't have time to go into the detail. But here, let me just talk a, a briefly about the third example here, okay? namely how uh, Chinese therapists reshape this sand play theory in order to create a new brand of psychotherapy through uh, fusion. So uh, sand play uh, therapy is called the Shapan Yoshi. Okay? It's a therapeutic model developed by uh, a Swiss therapist, Dora Kauf. Uh, now, the idea is through a free creative play and a visual uh, three-dimensional form, as you can see here, the therapist is able to access the unconscious uh, process of their client. And Chinese practitioners explain to me that uh, sand play theory draws inspirations from Chinese cultural elements. Uh, so Kauf, the inventor, uh, studied the Chinese as a child and became keenly interested in Chinese culture, particularly Taoism and Tai Ji Tu. 
and she later became the student of Carl Jung and followed his theory and thinking closely. And Jung himself, as some of you know, was also heavily influenced by uh, Chinese philosophy and religion, especially Yi Jing. Uh, a key person who introduced sand play theory into China is Professor Shen Heyong, now widely recognized as the expert uh, on sand play therapy in China. Um, Shen, as you can see here, a combination of uh, modern therapy and traditional culture. <laughs> Um, Sheng argues that there is a deep connection between um, this therapy, Yong, and Chinese culture, and this affinity makes it possible for further development of a truly Bentuhua psychotherapy that blurs the boundary uh, between the West and the East, the traditional and the modern. So in the article titled Yong and China, a continued dialogue, uh, Shen details the profound influence of a German sinologist and translator, Richard Wilhelm, on Jung, uh, who, uh, Jung, who later wrote uh, an introduction for two books translated by uh, Wilhelm, Yi Jing and The Secret of the uh, Golden Flower, Tai Yi Jinghua Zongzhi. Uh, it's a very famous um, uh, a book of meditation. <clears throat> So Shen has identified two important links between Yong and Chinese culture and Buddhism. The first is the, uh, it's a quote here, the mandala as a manifestation of the self's intrinsic ability to hold and thus integrate the unconscious in an individual way. Um, and the second link is the importance of uh, symbolic images, uh, yi xiang, Chinese yi xiang, as readable archetypes in therapeutic communications. So yi xiang literally means an object right, laden with meanings, and it's shaped by a shared cultural repertoire, uh, as well as personal uh, experiences. Uh, Professor Shen trained his students how to grasp and interpret the yi xiang that emerged in the therapeutic uh, uh, process. Um, uh, primarily through sand play and hypnosis. By uh, delving into Chinese religion, mythology, uh, cosmology and literature. So time is out? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Two or three minutes. Oh, okay. I'm done. Almost done. Yeah. So in 2009, uh, Shen co organized uh, an international conference called The Role of Yi Xiang in Psychotherapy at Fudan University um, in the effort to bridge you know, this Yi Xiang theory, Yong, uh, Yong in psychology with contemporary ther therapeutic uh, techniques. Um, another uh, Chinese therapist, Zhu Jianjun, has also branded his approach as the imagery communication psychotherapy, Yi Xiang Dui Hua. Uh, and the gist is that the dialogue with Yi Xiang uh, offers a much better contour um, of uh, grasping Chinese psychological experiences. And he also published his book in simultaneous in Chinese and English, so you can see his ambition to talk to the global community of psychotherapy. Um, I have some more examples. I think I'll skip them, but come to um, the conclusion here. Some, some reflection here. Uh, yeah, I skipped this one. This is a person I was going to talk about, how he followed this uh, uh, yi xiang dui hua theory, but that's fine. Um, so um, understanding, uh, for me, understanding the psych fever and the rise of the therapeutic ethos in China uh, will reveal deeper transformations brought by the market reform and the global encounter. So, uh, but rather than you know, recounting a familiar story of Western therapeutic interventions uh, going to a, a different place and over, uh, kind of taking over local cultural norms and healing, uh, my research attempts to show an experimental dialogic process of alterity uh, between the local and the global, uh, whose outcomes cannot be easily uh, presumed. Uh, through a constant dialogue, translation, and rearticulation between much multiple uh, regimes of knowledge and ethics, uh, new assemblages of emotional healing with the so-called Chinese characteristics uh, might be emerging. Uh, however, at this point, it's very hard to predict um, you know, whether these new assemblages would eventually lead to the formation of a distinct uh, regime of psychological knowledge well uh, integrated into the global circulation, or they would remain just very patchy and, and local. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
um, we wish we could have more time to hear the fuller story, but uh, now we have to quickly move from Chinese psyche to Chinese cars. Professor Seder. I'd like to thank the uh, Institute of East Asian Studies and the organizers of the conference for having me. And it's very exciting for me to talk to um, people in China studies and East Asian studies, um, particularly because I'm an Americanist. And this is sort of a new audience for me as I embark on a new project. And I should point out that the title of the, of the paper is actually Chinese Automobility and US Rhetorics of Identicality not identity. Identity is actually maybe too slippery a concept for me to talk about. Identicality, sameness, is really what I'm thinking about in this paper. Um, and I'd like to begin just touching on a couple of um, uh, things that I've been thinking about all day, in particular, um, Wen Xin Ye's comment this morning that we need to really rethink the way in which the transformation of China in the past 30 or 40 years really has affected uh, the way in which we construct and disseminate knowledge and, and, uh, of its history. And um, uh, also, Joe Escherich's thinking about the ways in which revolution and the revolutionary era is really, really important to understanding all sorts of things in China today, but particularly what I want to talk about, and that's infrastructure and infrastructural investments. So let me begin there um, by talking about uh, beginning in the early 1990s, uh, the Chinese government embarked upon a massive road building project to rival that of the United States, eventually to surpass it. Um, the United States has about a 47,000 mile interstate highway system. Um, China's planning 53,000 miles. Um, at present, there are about 25 or 26,000 miles of this highway. This monumental initiative is the official manifestation of the car culture currently being constructed by and for the rising middle class, especially in the booming coastal cities. So what I see happening in China right now is the, uh, the assembly and installation of a system of automobility. Now automobility is um, uh, a term that means sort of the, the dispositions, the landscapes, the legal infrastructure as well as the actual concrete, if you'll forgive the pun, infrastructure of the road system. Automobility is the emotions and the psychic investments in cars as well as the cars themselves and the spaces on which they drive. Um, so what I'm very interested in here is both the situation in China as it is, installs this apparatus of automobility and the perception of this installation to the rest of the world, particularly in the United States, and the way in which the visual landscapes and the practices of automobility in China construct a particular type of China for the consumption of American audiences, something that has politi political ramific ramifications. Um, and what I'm looking at here is really the way in which automobility is seen to perform a sort of um, new missionary work in China, habituating Chinese people to the dispositions of what we might think of as modernity or as uh, Marc Auger calls it, super modernity. Um, what does this really mean? And so as I look at Chinese automobility, uh, I think about the chorus of voices that's asking around the world, what is this going to lead to, both in environmental terms but also and, in, and particularly in political terms. So let me just uh, sketch out a little bit about the way in which automobility is construed in the United States. And the slide up here, um, this is probably from about 1899. It's a slide called Scorching, in which we see the thrill of early automobility. And it's um, uh, one of the things I argue in my book, which is about automobility in the US, is that automobility in its earliest iteration is actually a feminine 
pastime, sort of a whirly gig um, for the effete rich and therefore um, for, for the feminine. And so here we see these two women out on a country drive, scorching with, with their trusty dog, of course, leading the way. And you can see the speed by the scarf going out here behind her. She's probably uh, hurtling along at a, at a clip of about 23, 24 miles an hour. So we know it's really exciting. And also um, driving as the act of citizenship. One of the things I argue is that um, driving becomes a performance of freedom and an emblematic act of American citizenship. This is deeply built into the infrastructures of automobility that have been laid out in the United States. And so as Americans look to China, what they see is this sort of liberal citizenship um, being projected and also, along with the roads, being installed in the political culture. But also driving as one of the cardinal acts of the consumer as well. This is a, um, an advertisement, uh, it's actually on a road map for Shell from um, the 1930s. And what's interesting is that automobility becomes an index of China's assumption of what is to the United States, to American audiences, a creditable modernity. And this is Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, first from 1824. Um, sort of dissertating here on China's reverend dullness, its torpor and immobility. The closer contemplation we, con we condescend to bestow, the more disgustful is that booby nation. I have no gift to see a meaning in the venerable vegetation of this extraordinary people. They are tools for other nations to use. Even miserable Africa can say, I have hewn the wood and drawn the water to promote the civilization of other lands. But China, reverend dullness, hoary idiot, all she can say at the convocation of nations must be, I made the tea. Um, later on, in front of an audience of Chinese diplomats, in Boston, Emerson is a little bit more decorous. He says, we had said of China, as the old prophet said of Egypt, her strength is to sit still before allowing, but in its immovability, this race has claims. And we see this time and again. Um, I was very interested in Hans Steinmuller's presentation um, where he was discussing uh, mobility as some sort of index of modernity in everyday life in China. And we see this time and again as American commentators look to China and they want to see mobility as some sort of evidence, individual, volitional, autonomous mobility as evidence of China's modernity. Um, George Seward, uh, uh, in 1870, he was general consul in Shanghai at the time, in a letter to his State Department colleagues confessed his scorn at a nation where nowhere could be found, among other things, quote, one carriage road. The average American or Englishman, Seward further noted, would be unworthy of the Anglo-Saxon blood which runs in his veins if he should teach himself the Chinese habit of thought and to sit down to believe with the immobile mass around him that whatever is, is best. So uh, Mark Twain also in 1868 um, uh, commenting on the Burlingame Treaty is very interested in the assumption of China of a railroad system. Even though he's sympathetic to the idea that the Chinese don't necessarily want an American imposed railroad, railway system comes in, he allows um, the railways must be built. Railways are simply a symbol of modernity. Um, the historian Grover Clark in 1935 wrote, railways and motor cars, the telegraph, the airplane, and the other products of the West, mechanics and science, unquestionably are introducing new influences into, into Chinese life, but the basic conditions which determine Chinese civilization remain. So what we see here is an overall assessment of cecility um, attached to China on the part of American observers. And this stretches all the way up until roughly a decade ago. Immobility an inability to actually um, move forward, but also an inability of its people to move. The scorn oozing from these sentiments may be read as an emotive disguise for the anxious positioning of the United States at the far end of the continuum of mobility. In the United States, the foundational texts that Arif Derlich sees 
as the interpretive material of culturalism include the emblematic landscapes of mobility carved into the continent from the 18th century forward. Since their emergence in the last decade of the 19th century, the practices and environments of automobility have given crucial substance to the abstract con conceptions of freedom that permeate liberal political rhetoric and economic culture. By 1922, you saw um, uh, a belief in automobility as an index of civilization really made explicit. And this is interesting to me because I thought automobility sort of appears in uh, the American lexicon in about 1903, and then it disappears until 1961 when a historian um, uh, cites it again. But I was wrong. And um, thinking about Tim Cheek's idea of discovery research, is it discovery research to discover something in the, uh, in the archives of the New York Times? Well, I hope so, because I discovered this again, um, uh, uh, article from 1922. It would be conceded to argue that the civilization of the people is directly as its ability to move about in vehicles that are self-propelled. One might compare, for example, the United States with the Malay states or with Liberia, whose capital is credited with three motors. Moreover, according to some scientists, the development of life from its lower into its higher ranges is the result of its struggle to escape a static slavery of roots into a freedom of feet, and then from a freedom of feet into a mobility of wheels and of wings. As a rule, automobility implies higher individual power, better economic distribution, and a potentially higher social state. If Russia, which has only 35,000 motors for her 150 millions, and China, with but 8,150 8, for her 400 millions, were more highly motorized, such intensive famine conditions as have prevailed in those countries could hardly have persisted. Certain political conditions would also not have been conceivable in a highly automotive state. So once again, we're beginning to see this rhetoric of automobility as an index of civilization, as an index of progress. Also by the 1920s, China began to figure in the automobilization of the United States. Again, China imaged as a static, um, uh, uh, non-dynamic nation. And what you see here, um, I'm sorry it's sort of hard to read, but this is from 1923. And it says, it's, a, it's actually an advertisement, a political advertisement for a referendum against speed governors in automobiles. Speed governors, which you find in golf carts, for example, which don't let you go above a certain um, mile per hour. And um, Cincinnati auto dealers, and auto dealers, in fact, all around the, the nation, were against this measure. They did not want to see automobility limited in terms of its speed. And it says, um, the Great Wall of China against progress. Would you build a wall around, around Cincinnati and retard your city's progress? To remind the populace of what China signifies here, um, it, they write, China is the most backward of all nations. So China figures as some sort of foil for the United States here as the United States contemplates its own automobility and installs automobility um, in its own landscape. Now we have to remember, and the historian Peter Norton is very, um, uh, very perspicacious on this, that automobility is a battle that the whole narrative of the love affair with the car, which is also now being constructed in China, um, was anything but a fait accompli, and that the automobile caused massive amounts of destruction and death, which we're also seeing in China now, as it begins to become habituated to automobility. But um, massive campaigns of mothers in American cities um, uh, against the slaughter of the automobile, because we have to remember that public space is not automobilized yet. The streets are for pedestrians and for children playing. They are not for cars. And the way the safety campaigns that we have, um, that we all had as children, um, are being installed in China now, as that society is acculturated to the automobile for better or worse. This had begun earlier, um, again, as I say, sort of China's assumption of a creditable modernity involved um, uh, the assumption of driving. From the 1913 uh, ed edition of the New York Times, Mandarins like motor cars now. They are slow customers, but loyal to a chop or trademark, prefer brown cars. Some 800 cars in Shanghai, 
Um, and I think it's very interesting. We've had this conversation earlier about revolution and about Shanghai, but I think Shanghai, and Leo Li's book uh, um, is uh, very articulate about this, is a city of automobility in which the automobile functions as a crucial symbol of modernity. By 1926, Ford was making its pitch um, to China. Uh, this car will allow you to save costs. The car has good handling. It's basically what the, um, um, I'm sure you all can, can read this far better than I, but uh, this car has good handling. Those who've driven long distances have used this car, which can take 12 to 16 people, and then the price. So, um, of course, Ford and other American automobile companies, in addition to British companies, are very interested in um, what uh, most capitalists in the West have always been interested in, which is the China market. So why no automobility in China after 1949? Um, this is some, a question I'm very interested in, and I would certainly like to hear what you all have to say about it. Um, but my sense is that um, Mao and the CCP in their pursuit of an alternative modernity were interested in um, uh, a different mode of mobility as well that had some sort of symbolic difference. And I'm thinking here not of automobility but of velomobility, the um, trans transport by bicycle. And this is, of course, a flying pigeon. Um, and the quote, bicycles it is, does anybody know the reference? Um, this is in Simon Winchester's book, uh, The Man Who Loved China, and this is the, uh, uh, the purported exchange between Joseph Needham and uh, Mao Zedong when uh, Needham is called in and, and um, asked, uh, uh, do I should I let my, my, uh, my people uh, drive automobiles or should I have them ride bicycles? And uh, Needham supposedly goes into this reverie where he thinks about his own bicycle, um, and he says, well, I, I think it's, it'd be just fine um, to have them keep riding bicycles and not to pursue uh, car driving. And Mao apparently claps his hands together and says with gusto, right, bicycles it is. And so this was the, um, uh, supposedly in the early, early 1970s, this exchange happened. Whether you believe Winchester or not is another thing. Um, by the 1970s, um, and again, this is after the publication of Needham's um, uh, uh, volumes on science in China, um, and what you have here, this is from the New York Times uh, from 1978, and uh, you have um, two men driving on this mountain road being chased by a dragon. One says to the other, the sad thing, if it catches us, is that no one will know we invented the motor car in 1327. So you see here um, China being in some ways rehabilitated, and I see this as a precursor to what happens in the 90s and what begins hap to happen in the American press um, looking at China, which applies all sorts of uh, uh, really loaded terms, most important being freedom, revolution, modernity. Um, this is from Fortune in 2003. The profusion of cars in China has launched a new cultural revolution, transforming Chinese life and society in ways that bear surprising resemblance to what happened in America 50 years ago. People in China are exactly like in the United States. They want to be independent. If you look on the highways, they're all driving alone. It's stupid, but they're doing it. This is a Volkswagen executive quoted in the New York Times. And then finally, the idea is from America, and like America, China will also enter the auto, auto age. The young generation of China is seeking modernity from NBC News in 2004. So the reason I bring up these quotes is because what you see is, again, this positing of identicality. Um, a people and a nation that has been so radically and forcefully othered from the 18th century forward um, being rendered same, and automobility is the mechanism through which this happens. And what I see in the United States are these landscapes of compulsory automobility in which um, the joy and the pleasure and the thrill and the autonomy of having a car have been supplanted by the necessities of driving. And I'm thinking about this in terms of the possibility of 
um, landscapes of compulsory automobility in China. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make two very brief uh, comments and open the floor. Uh, one of the things, uh, although this uh, you know presentation is actually made in haste, uh, but one of these things, if we want to use the term identity, I think in the 1950s, it seems there was this true historical possibility for China to imitate Russia, no? At that time, at least uh, from this uh, Eurasian uh, 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 photo show, we can see there is institutionally, huh? maybe any time, I don't know, but, so but you said Russia, you mean when it I said in 1950s, 1950s, uh, probably early 60s. You know, by that time, I think the people uh, uh, in China, by that time, probably could see a real possibility of being identical with the bigger socialist brother. So, and then, you know, uh, today we can see, <laughs> it seems that history has become so remote, that possibility has become really a weird, you know, uh, historical error. In, to, to many uh, intellectual uh, minds. On the other hand, uh, in the first two papers, uh, Zhang Li's and um, the paper on uh, automobile, automobility, I thought there is a, really there is a, a slight uh, contradictory sentiment we can read out. Because in Zhang Li, paper, we see these possibilities of, uh, you know, Chinese tradition or Chinese culture or whatever things we can call it, um, in absorbing the world influence of Western, you know, or American, you know, whatever things that we call it, modern or global, China or Chinese people would be able to sort of uh, transform it, to take it into, into their own control and hand. But on the other hand, uh, if we think about economic development, if we think about uh, you know, automobility, you know, some kind of implication of freedom to be envisioned on both sides, then we see really in the future, we probably see really a great uh, identity or really a, a similarity between the these two things. So this is actually one of the things, one of the things I thought uh, really interesting by this panel. Uh, we could probably think about uh, what is actually the true uh, possibility here. So uh, this is actually one, one uh, this is actually one, you know, from this uh, panel, I really want to make this comment. But in relation to this, question, you know, to what extent Chinese culture could continue to function as really a local power in resisting or forming uh, or reforming the global influence. In relation to this question, I thought uh, today's uh, conversation, especially in the uh, previous panel, uh, Hans' paper, uh, he actually gave us uh, this very interesting uh, um, uh, uh, indication uh, in the later part of his talk. He said, you know, peasants actually now gain this power to play with you. No? If you just want to go there to talk about uh, superstition, superstition and other sort of uh, such categories, either official or modern, they wouldn't really have any problem in discussing with you by denying or negating those categories. No, there's not a problem, you know. Every peasant, uh, in many ways, I think they are probably even more rational if you talk to them in abstract, official language. I thought this one, this one is actually really, for me, is it really a very interesting question that is now uh, China poses for the world. If you now go to China to talk to Hu Jintao, we just saw his uh, uh, picture. If you want to go to talk to him about democracy, human rights, you know, the importance of law, 
I don't really think it has any problem in telling you China has really tried every possible means to set up all these institutions and uh, social norms. But the problem here is really the, the, the problem of practice. That's why I thought uh, the earlier uh, conversation um, uh, uh, from, from this morning till now is really, uh, what if now China has accept, you know, in abstraction, all these categories and conceptions globally or more than, you know, conception, global or more than conceptions? How can we actually deal with this problem in practice? Still, I think there is a lot of things that when you go into a village, you know, today uh, we heard this um, uh, excellent, uh, uh, maybe a very uh, optimistic, you know, uh, paper from Jiang on how to do social sciences by the local people. I'm very sure, you know, in this kind of social science practice, uh, power, money, and many other things, corruption, or many other things would actually also happen. So this is actually the, uh, I think America or China probably produces a set of knowledge questions for us, no? What uh, Hans uh, uh, called uh, the second layer or second, uh, second, basically second order. Basically here the representations themselves are no longer a problem. The problem is actually the play. Even the peasants, they are conscious of this, uh, you know, uh, possibility of, you know, uh, uh, talking in abstract. Then, in the concrete, in the concrete, the double sense uh, we heard, uh, in the concrete uh, practice, there may be a lot of problems that, uh, you know, um, political science or anthropology or Western social sciences uh, still need to. Uh, uh, face, I think. Why don't I stop here and uh, open the floor? Yeah. Uh, can we hear the questions first? For Professor Styler, about his paper. Okay, okay. Go ahead. In your last graphic, I think you had something about the Eisenhower interstate system, and I wonder, wonder if you don't want to include in your thinking on the new book what we have all this wonderful automobile system for. I mean, it was supposed to be Eisenhower saw the Autobahn and was impressed by the utility and the necessity of it for the US for national security purposes. You're talking about the automobile the network as, as promoting consumerism or civilization or citizenship or whatever, but that's not what that interstate system was sold on the basis of and why it had the impetus isn't it, don't, don't I remember Eisenhower saw the Autobahn in, in Germany and saw what the use it had, and that's why we have it? That's part of the okay. mythos of that. It's actually not. It isn't true? It's something I argue against in my book. Not in the paper, though. Not no, in not in paper. this paper. No. Thank you. Um, one of the chapters of my book is on um, the interstate highway system in the Cold War and the way the thesis of utility and, and military utility in particular played into that. that that actually got added on um, in 1955 as a means of uh, shepherding through the Jesus process. The thesis about this book is that it does have to do with why China is building these, besides just being able to build more interstate highways than per mile, I mean by mile, than the U.S. has. I also disagree with that. I think it's. Um, I think one of the keys is, is nationalism. And the military applications might be there, but I think they're superseded by, by the more civilian uses. Can civilian. we can we stop this conversation? Open the floor. Can you just tell me what is the application of the modern modern Because I just said, you know, <laughs> I mean, can automobility define the modernism? Because hey, you've been to Europe, right? You've been to Holland. Mm -hmm. I mean, they love their bicycles. And they're, they don't even have a parking spot. Yeah. So I mean, I kind of wonder what your definition of modernism is. Can you please tell me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Can we take a few, uh, three or four questions? And then, yes. Uh, this is really good talks, and mm -hmm. I got a lot out of it. And mm -hmm. so I have, I have uh, two questions, one for um, Cotton and one for uh, Zhang Li. Uh, for Zhang Li, the psychotherapy thing is, I, I think is really, 
the psychotherapy thing is really interesting. And I have been kind of listening to some people uh, talk about it in China and the idea. And uh, you presented it really well. And I have uh, two, general, two general questions. First, in the American sense, there's this topic called wounded healers. And it's people who have their own psychological problems that haven't really worked them out and go to school for that. And then they're going to help other people. And they've talked about this in the, in the psych uh, discussion. The reason I know this is my, um, my mom and her husband are, are clinical psychologists, so they talk a lot about, um, I said, why don't you have more of your friends over for dinner from the, from the office and stuff? Oh, no, 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 they're, they're more screwed up than my patients. So um, did you run into any of that um, in, your, in your research um, in the China context? Second, um, in the, the psychotherapy uh, arena, partial studies I mean, studying only part of it, people who drop out of the program after a year or two years um, can't get a license, and many, many people would argue should not get a license. They said that you can do more harm than good with just a little bit of psychotherapy knowledge and not the complete. How would you uh, address that in the China context when they talk about that in the American context? Um, and again, I think it's following what you're doing. And second, on the, um, with cotton on the roads and cars, have you looked at the geographic concentration of cars? not just the roads. Um, I was talking with um, um, Peter and, and Mary, we were talking about how these incredible roads, and anybody who spends time out of Beijing, these massive five, 10 lane roads with nothing on them, and nobody on them. A few bicycles, some tractors, uh, and maybe coal trucks, of course, coming through. So how is, does a concentration of roads, uh, concentration of cars, how does that fit with the roads in, in that respect? And again, really good discussion. I uh, just a, uh, a comment on um, cars. You might um, like to look at the 50s and 60s when Beijing was created as a car city. They tore down the city walls to create multi-lane highways around the city. And <clears throat> the city was reconstructed on the basis of a motor vehicle. So China has been aspiring to this, these vast highways from right through the socialist period. And the very nature of um, car culture under the Carter system is one that's worth looking at. You might like to refer a paper to a paper I published 10 years ago called um, Wheels of Revolution in a book called Autopia, which is published by Reaction Books. There's also a great Australian film on, um, on uh, the Hosol Zoku, or Bozol, or what are they call them? Hot Rodders in Beijing, that just came out about two years ago, again in Australia by Stefan, some of you, an ABC movie. You might find interesting because it's a very interesting sort of look at um, the car culture of Beijing today and the, the, the notional violence associated with vehicles. Just a cute reference. And the, the word used for, for hot rodder is the Japanese word hosozoku and Chinese bozozu. You, know, you might find that useful. Mm -hmm. Why don't we have two of them uh, respond, respond to this and then for the questions? Please go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, first question, of course, yeah, wounded healers are uh, absolutely true in, ch in the Chinese context. And in fact, uh, a lot of the therapies I uh, interviewed actually told me that how they started you know, the program or became interesting is because they had their own problems. And then they went for the training. And then they felt very enlightened. And now they want to save other people. So it's a, almost like a religious salvation mission there. So it, I don't know whether they're more screwed up than, than the patients, but certainly they began with a lot of psychological problems with, with, with themselves. So that, that's there. And then the second thing, you know, a little training can probably do more harm than, than, than good. It's also absolutely true. You know, I, I oftentimes when I talk about this um, topic, I always say it's scary. And then people will say, why do you say it's scary? I say, Precisely, the scary is with, with a little bit of knowledge, and they think they're capable of healing people, and they go out to do that. But, uh, but in fact, uh, it's uh, vastly you know, underdeveloped to their skill, and it, it, it's scary in that sense. On the other hand, I'm very sort of ambivalent about this phenomenon I'm describing here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm feeling happy that people began to sort of have this more awareness and you know, because there's a tremendous amount of undertreatment in China. And I know a lot of people you know, from family and friends that suffer from that and never have the access to any possible you know, treatment. So it, it's, it's great in that sense. On the other hand, this is sort of the early stage of development. So you see this a, a great deal of really careless and reckless practice for, for the sake of profit. People are talking about money, making money. So um, it, it's very dangerous uh, on, on the other hand. So I don't know. So I'm very ambivalent about what's, what's happening in China. Yeah. OK. 
thank you for your questions. Um, first of all, what is, what is modernity? Um, wow. Uh, it's a great question. And I think what, um, the way that I would answer it from my particular um, vantage would be to think about um, modes, of, modes of mobility and what mobility means. And I think about um, uh, modernity as it's sort of envisaged in, in European and, and, and Atlantic discourses is, um, has a, much to do with emancipation of the self. And in fact, a compulsion to perform this emancipation of the self uh, serially and ritually. Um, and your, your question about a, a space like the, the, the Dutch space of mobility is really interesting because one of the things that you see is that um, what constitutes freedom and modern mobility is going to be different in different contexts. Um, and I find it very interesting that now that we have these landscapes of, of compulsory automobility increasingly that are, that are global, I mean, uh, in Lagos, Nigeria, the traffic jams stretch for miles and miles. In Beijing, I've taken a taxi a block and gotten out and crossed the street and then gotten another taxi the next block. To, to, so I, and um, in the United States, these compulsory spaces. And now you find in systems, for example, in Paris, they have this bicycle rental system. And it's marketed as enhancing your freedom. And so it's a freedom from automobility as opposed to an enhancement of automobility. So one of the things I see, though, as maybe one of the characteristics of, mod of modernity is a political imaginary of competition that is sort of practiced through mobility. Um, but I'd love to talk to you about, about it more because it's a question I'm really thinking about. Yeah, thanks for your question. Hi, I have a question for Zhang Li. Actually, two questions. The first one is kind of complicated, but um, so if you just bear with me, I don't know if I can explain my uh, thoughts clearly, but um, because this is a, a conference on knowledge making about China, um, something I think about a lot as an anthropologist is the fact that a lot of times what we find um, compelling about our arguments are the ways in which we find conversations between um, the people that we talk to in China and um, conversations that are ongoing in Western um, contexts or Western disciplines or research on the West. Um, and so I guess the question I want to ask is, it seems like uh, Bantu Hua is interesting in the sense that it can respond to an American concern that what you spoke this, um, you brought up a, a critic, Ethan Walker. Walters, yeah. Walters, okay. So it's interesting for him um, to make a claim that um, there's an Americanization of the psyche or of psychiatric illness. Um, and Bantu Hua is interesting in the sense that it can um, be a counter argument to that. And so I guess I'm curious um, for the Chinese um, psychotherapists that you're talking to, do you think that um, why they find Bantu Hua interesting is interesting for the same reasons? Do you think that the concerns are the same from that angle? Um, so that's my first question. And then um, the second question, I'm very interested in whether or not. Um, because you brought up that one of the psychotherapeutic treatments was similar to um, thought work. And so from my understanding, thought work is um, helping people get their thoughts to a healthy state that can be defined what that state is. And I'm curious whether in psychotherapy today, do you see a similar kind of singular concept of what health is in terms of um, thinking? Hi, <clears throat> this question is for Cotton. Seiler, um, in your book you wrote that in the U.S. that um, automobility rose during times of crises and shifts in capitalism. And I was wondering if you would be pursuing a similar approach in China, and if so, is there a crisis, and, and, um, or is it something maybe a more positive development? Um, I have, I have, is it on? I have questions for each of the p 
paper writers, and so I'll, but I'll try to be uh, very fast. And I have a comment about what Leo Shin said at the beginning about studying practice. And I think that's obviously, not maybe obviously, but that's really important when we study these concepts we've been talking about and concepts that are in political science like rule of law or democracy or whatever. But I would also argue that practice and differences between institutions and practices exist everywhere, not just in China. And it's a, you know, for example, for the legal system, it's actually a great thing to study because in every legal system you have corruption, you have, um, you know, institutions that don't work in the in practice like they do in theory, and China's not an exception. Okay, so my questions are first of first for um, the automobility. I also agree with Jeremy that I think there is something. So I'm not sure what the book is about. If the book is about the United States, sort of our identity or, or our vision of cars then reflected on China by journalists who are American and who study, who, who go to China to report. Uh, that's one thing. But if it's more about the Chinese conception of what, an, what a car means, I think uh, the United States notions are not really that important. Um, they may you know, be used by US auto execs to talk about what they're doing in China, but I don't think for China itself it's very important. And I think it goes back to first this idea um, that started in the, uh, with the 1950s um, by the, the Communist Party and then was sped up in the 1980s is that an automobile industry is critical to China's modernization. And that's much more, I think, about Japan and Korea, uh, looking at how they, how they successfully kind of rose out of um, you know, inferiority to the United States to become competitive. The other thing, which is not related to the state, but related to Chinese consumers of cars, when I, th and I think about Chinese and, and Japanese uh, friends that I've known living in both places, that Chinese consumption of cars is about personal freedom, but as that is not a political freedom. That's a freedom of, into, uh, of yourself, of your body, um, and, 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 and maybe even more freedom from the family than, than from the political system. So those are just, I guess, some comments about... Um, I just remember living in Tokyo and everybody would have sex in the car because you couldn't have sex in the apartments. And I'm sure in China it's, it's the same thing. Um, my question to Li Zhang is very simple. I'm just interested in, um, because a lot of professions in China are competitive with lower level workers doing the same work. And this is the problem in the legal system where you have competition between lawyers and legal service workers or legal workers. So do you see the same thing happening as psychology departments reopen, as social work develops in China? Is, are, you, are you starting to see competition between these sort of badly trained uh, counselors and more professionally trained um, um, academics or, or professionals. And um, my third question, I'm sorry to go on so long, uh, to, to Gwendolyn is, I'm really struck by you know, the images that you showed, particularly to make the point about the Soviet comparison. I think that's right. I think there is um, a contradiction among the Chinese leadership now about how to present themselves. And I think, just to simplify, how to present, what? How to present themselves. Right, to how to present themselves to external bodies. And I think, um, this is to simplify it, but I think one could say that if you compare the 60th anniversary parade to the 2008 Olympics, you can see that contradiction very clearly. So 2008 Olympics was to present themselves to Westerners. Right? The Communist Party is totally absent from that uh, presentation. I mean, they, they orchestrated it and they, they, they spent a lot of money on it, but they are absent. And then in the 60th anniversary parade, it is all about Soviet images. And I think that's really interesting. And it's, it reminds me too, when we have delegations from Chinese universities, the party secretaries, which is the most powerful position, are now um, on their name cards. They are the chair of the university council. So no mention again of the party. Yeah, just a few more questions about automobility. I guess when we all go to China now, we're struck by the multiplicity of uh, transportation forms on the street at any given time. So is there a scooter ability? And uh, uh, I mean, the, the fact that there are so many different forms in the street doesn't make a difference. It also reminds me, a few years ago, I took my six-year-old to China, and like a good uh, Californian, she used to just walking out in the street. And she took quite a bit of effort to not get her killed in a matter of a couple of weeks in China because that's a very dangerous thing. So is there a pedestrian ability element to it as well? And is that something to understand? And then lastly, um, another thought that comes to mind is you're talking mostly about highways. And uh, I was just in a village in which they had just taken a, uh, a footpath and broadened it out to be a very narrow one-lane road. And of course, that completely transforms uh, life up in a remote village up in, up in the mountains. So 
Uh, I was there for a village election, but the whole story was about uh, roads. Everybody was talking about roads, how many roads you built, how many more roads you're going to build. That's entirely what everybody was talking about. So I was wondering what uh, to, to what part does small country roads play into your understanding of automobility in China? Why don't we let uh, three of them uh, respond uh, briefly? When, okay. uh, can we start with the, uh, okay. the end of yeah. the, when did you start? Yeah. Well, I mostly just wanted to thank you for your comments, and I'd like to follow up afterwards, if I may, with, with some ideas with it. Thanks. All right. Well, you've given me an awful lot to chew on there. Um, if I can sort of draw together um, this comment and this one, um, the answer is yes. I do see automobility in China as um, being promoted and sort of growing out of a crisis. And I very much see it as the crisis of legitim legitimacy that occasions June 4th and, um, and follows after it. And I see it very much as, um, uh, to draw on Mary's question, as a way in, in which a hegemony restabilizes itself. Um, that precisely that type of freedom, um, the gamble is if you let people drive, um, they're going to feel free. And that freedom will ultimately um, be contained in some way through automobility and through consumption. And this is what I'm hearing whenever I um, talk to students from China. They talk about, you know, we talk about democracy, and they're like, well, we have, but we have roads now, we can drive cars, and we, have, we can consume, and we have all these stores, and, and they kind of don't, don't make that leap. And I think if, um, f from the perspective of the CCP, I think the ability from the freedom of the road and the freedom of, autonom of autonomy that you feel while driving, which are powerful sensations, as long as those can remain disarticulated from political liberalism and that type of freedom, I think it's a very safe bet. Now, one of the things I'm interested in in the United States is the way in which those, those two things are deeply articulated and seem inseparable. I think they are, I think they're, they're coincidental rather than um, um, mutually necessary. And so I see um, the, the, the crisis of legitimacy um, after Tiananmen to be the sort of uh, the, the cultural, social, and political conditions out of which auto mass automobility becomes a logical, a logical choice and a, and a good gamble. Um, Kevin, just very, very briefly, absolutely pedestrianism and the rules of, um, um, of good mobile citizenship, I think, are things that have to be created. In, in the United States, they're created um, by partners in industry and the state um, in order to preclude the type of regulation of the auto industry and of cars um, that the, the, the industry didn't want. And so in China right now, what you're seeing is the socialization of people to the spaces of automobility, which means how to be a good pedestrian in addition to how to be a good highway driver, city driver, all of these things that are that I think um, people in the United States think of as we, we live and breathe them, and we forget that they were, there was a massive cultural undertaking to create this that really took place from about 1908 to about 1930. So I think that's happening now. Uh, yeah. Okay, quickly to respond to some uh, very good questions here. Um, first is the Bantu Hua, the question. Uh, you know, for me here, we're talking about it's more intellectual project, but uh, for the Chinese therapist, um, they are less concerned about this intellectual aspect, but for them, it's a practi practical matter. Now, you talk to, talk to your patient about Lacan, about Freud, about the sexual oppression, all the stuff. Uh, they just feel, first of all, they don't understand. Second, it's very hard for their patients to, to talk about those issues. Uh, so for them, it's a practical matter. Uh, they have to make it understandable to their patients in order for them to come back. Uh, thought work and um, CBT, I just want to give you one interesting information. You know, during my interview, I found out a lot of those uh, uh, therapists, actually, their previous life, uh, they used to work in uh, colleges or schools as Xiang Gong Zuo. You know, in colleges, you have specialized in Xiang Gong Zuo, Zheng Zi Xiang Gong Zuo, you know, uh, lecturers. So they now they found this. Uh, 
shift very easy and they find it makes sense, you know, how you change one's way of thinking. Uh, although there are some fundamental difference here, right? In uh, thought work, there's more top down, you know, a party figure is talking to you and there is a more sort of a correct thinking. Now in CBT, uh, it, it advocates a much more egalitarian relationship and then the notion of mental health, what's health is very individualized. So it's not necessarily a, a unified notion. But I, I, I do find that very interesting. I'm going to dip, dig it deeper to, to find that connection there. And for uh, Mary's question, yes, there's a tremendous competition. There are actually three camps of practitioners in China. So you have the university psychologists who primarily think they produce theory, work on theory, and then they look down upon the self-fashioned uh, therapists. And then you have uh, hospital-based people who think drug is, is the best. Take by Yuji, everything will be fine. Talk therapy, no good, no good. And then you have this self-fashion. So there's a tremendous uh, competition there. But these people I'm working with, self-fashion, you know, poorly trained, they actually dominant the, the market primarily in, in clinical psychology. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just uh, briefly respond to, uh, to Mary's comment? Uh, I didn't really mean, simply mean, there is a difference between you know abstract theory and uh, actual practices. Of course, you are absolutely right. In every place, we need to actually look into uh, practices. But I thought the rise of China, at really for the world, uh, has introduces, has introduced this problem. No, uh, almost no obstacle these days for Chinese to accept all these terms, no? Democracy, freedom, automobility, and all these kind of things, but uh, the real uh, concrete historical and cultural traditions actually made uh, this kind of acceptance uh, uh, very, uh, I don't really think exactly the same experience we have in the United States, you know? For instance, Chinese government signed this uh, human rights you know, declaration, but it wouldn't really mean the same thing as any European or other uh, governments uh, sign it. So that's basically, I thought, exactly a very interesting you know, uh, uh, phenomenon that we would have to accommodate in some way, you know, uh, uh, despite of the fact we accept uh, 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 the uh, 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 data or whatever things we face, which are not true in, in, in the sense we define the term. So, but this is not, I'm not really saying that they are you know, liars or them because a lot of right wing uh, you know, politicians would actually use these kind of opportunities to criticize without actually any possibility to think about the historical and cultural question. So this is exactly, I thought, really a knowledge, uh, really this kind of you know, tradition, categories of political science or notions of revolution and everything would need to confront this you know, a new sort of uh, uh, emergence because of many other things. But in this process, interesting today's paper, although they are in very different fields, working on very different things. Because I read, I heard, or read two you know, possibilities here. One is actually, you know, as a global result, everybody will become similar. No? Resemblance will become the result of a global you know, uh, uh, development. That's actually one case. Everybody enjoys driving a car rather than riding a bicycle. So, on the other hand, I hear from Zhang Li's uh, you know, study on psychology, there is a great freedom and possibility for local knowledge to be re-emerged, to re-emerge in confronting these global forms. So this is exactly the, this is exactly the two things. You know, of course, as an anthropologist, I wish the you know, situation would be in the in, in hands of Professor Zhang Li rather than, you know, in the automobile industry, you no? Know, economists, they would actually make the world more and more similar one place to another. So in that sense, uh, this is actually the, the, the thing, the question we need to pose today. Because China used to have this utter confidence to imitate Russia. 
Now they turn to America. No longer, this is actually a fundamental question tied to the first panel we had. They no longer look to the past. Of course, we can say these days there's a Confucian talk, uh, uh, Dong Yue's uh, comment on Levinson was actually this, this question, you know. Confucianism has become really just a talk. So is this really an effect on China? You know, China began to really turn attention to global, you know, America, Europe, Japan, or other places to learn Russia. Or there's this real historical possibility for China to return to its own tradition. That's, I, I, I'm hearing this, even though they are working on very empirical uh, uh, projects, I'm hearing this really the knowledge production question that comes to my mind. Sorry. I talk. Yeah. Yeah, too. Yeah. Um, could the panelists or um, other colleagues and friends in the audience um, give a little explanation of this concept of local knowledge? We, we, everyone's using it, and um, I'm having a little question about it because, for example, um, the shrimp farmers in China, they are fully aware of what's going on around the world, and they're fully aware of the pricing system, and they're, they have incorporated all the antibiotics and everything technology. What is local knowledge? And in the case Zhang Li talks about, it sounds like um, they're integrating all these knowledges. Why do we call it local knowledge? What are we calling local knowledge? So what is local knowledge in today's China in a, a quite a <laughs> globalized world? Um, I have a couple of questions, um, starting with uh, cars. Now, um, these are technological products brought into the Chinese context. And if we think historically about, say, technology intersecting with Chinese culture and society, maybe yet another moment for us to consider maybe that of the clocks coming to China. In other words, mechanical clock being brought into China by uh, European diplomats. And uh, that happened as early as the 17th century. Now, Carlos uh, Chapola was the one who famously said that in any study of the social ramifications of technology, we have to keep in mind that it's not that technology drives people. It's people who make use of technology and in the process of that, causing things to change. So, I mean, we've been hearing questions um, from the audience already about, say, are there connections between, say, construction of highways and the concentration of cars. Going from there, we might also want to ask ourselves, is it a safe assumption to say that our, all cars are driven by car owners? In other words, ownership of vehicles and operation of vehicles are the same thing, are automatically the same thing. And the degree to which freedom or mobility might be associated more effectively with car ownership or car ability to operate these vehicles. And if you actually end up in a situation such as Hu Jintao, who certainly has disposal over uh, fleets of vehicles, in what way would this enhance his freedom or mobility in terms of this mediated, highly mediated relationship between the vehicle's owner and its actual operation. So, I mean, my point here is not to suggest that there is no way to, um, to uh, elaborate on this presentation, but rather that uh, perhaps it's useful to think about how that these technological products are being utilized within socioeconomic political uh, contexts uh, when the rubber hit the road, so to speak, in the Chinese case. 
And then, of course, uh, with regard to uh, this question about um, psychology, Zhang Li, I, I couldn't help um, remembering that Peng Kai Ping, for instance, who's been doing research in comparable areas, very often uh, would like to advance this thesis, namely if you take uh, sample groups of uh, people, Americans versus Chinese, as he puts it, broadly defined, that um, psychological tests would yield results to show that these are indeed uh, different groups of people, different cultural orientations, different kinds of things all together. So my question to you is in some ways also that psychology as a system of organized knowledge as well as as a counseling technology, right? What does it produce anyway? Namely, the degree to which such technological intervention in itself through its practice it's likely to lead to a higher degree of sameness across the board between uh, the Chinese subjects that you've been interviewing and, and, um, um, and, and other people, or likely going to produce a higher degree of uh, differences as the kinds of things that Peng Kai Ping would like us to see. Now, of course, the... Um, the ramifications of such findings can be quite enormous in terms of offering a cultural foundation for the um, representation of a range of policies and um, especially cultural policies. And then finally, Liu Xin, I think that um, uh, your comments inspire me to think that we have been discussing uh, China, the way that China as a nation uh, behaves, um, conducts its affairs as a nation state. We have also been discussing the Chinese people, that is, as Chinese people, either as individuals or as collectivity, um, conduct their affairs. You've raised the question about sameness versus differences across the board. And then I suppose uh, the one question I would like to add alongside with yours is the question of, say, the, the connections with regard to, say, sameness of Chinese people with people all around the world um, in a shared um, technological or global environment, whether such um, a uh, growing degree of affinity or sameness may or may not help us substantiate a position about China as a nation state and the likelihood of its development to become same or different historically, politically, culturally, intellectually, etc., with other nations. So in other words, what might be the connections of our findings about people, right? And then this is, as um, Dong Yue has been saying, I mean, people, along with local knowledge, is a very broad and ambiguous concept. So what might be the connection in our research about the people versus, or in the context, or whatever, the nation? Uh, just a, a very small, somewhat tangential, tangential uh, question to Cotton. Um, I, I was very struck by your noting the early uh, uh, advertisements for automobile in the United States as being directed at women um, and the women in those ads. And one of them said that advertising automobiles for recreation without humiliation, which I thought was a great line. Um, but I was wondering what humiliation are they escaping via the automobile? Um, are, uh, my impression is that it's largely men that are driving uh, automobiles in China and Can whether... That? That, is, that is a particular um, publication directed towards African Americans mm -hmm. well, that uh, one, in, uh, the, in the Jim Crow era. Okay, okay. And this is a, 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 it was a publication, a guidebook called Travel Guide 
vacation and recreation without humiliation. All of the covers, it ran from 1947 to 1957, all of the covers featured light-skinned African-American women. So it was the humiliation of Jim Crow not being able to eat at restaurants, stay at hotels, find mechanical assistance, et cetera. Of course, there's probably additional humiliations to be suffered by African-American women on the road as well. So thank you. When we have brief uh, responses, I think our time is already up. Yeah. Please, go ahead. Uh, you want to follow up your question and I'll, I'll, I'll do mine. Yes. OK. I, mm -hmm. um, um, this, is, this is a wonderful question. Um, uh, about the clocks, I mean, I think this is something that um, social historians of technology refer to as diffusion theory. And diffusion theory is the belief that once a technology uh, gains currency, as it spreads out, it simply mimics the patterns of reception and consumption. I do not believe this about, about the automobile. And I think this is much closer to Julin's comments that mm -hmm. as a um, as political concepts and structures mm -hmm. and forms of rhetoric travel mm -hmm. to different contexts, they, they themselves are transformed. Mm -hmm. And that the idea of human rights might mean something different. I think the practices and the meanings of, of, of automobility, and I don't want to restrict automobility just to cars, but the practices of cars, and, and to get back to, to Mary Gallagher's, Gallagher's question, it's never just about cars, it's also about roads. If you didn't have roads, then you'd have no substrate for automobility. Um, in terms of how it changes is um, people who are chauffeured, for example, the, the, um, the big wigs of, of the party. Um, what's interesting to me is in the 90s, there begin to appear in China um, what are called self-driving tours. And the self-driving is, is an important part of it because um, one of the things I, I see in automobility and um, this relates to my colleague's um, paper here, is the promise of automobility is both the assertive presence of the self and a protective obscuring of the body. But also, what automobility means, what driving and ownership and enclosure in a car means, is a type of privatizing interiority that has cultural and, I think, political effects that I see related to the type of interiority that's being posited now in this therapeutic culture. So I, I, I see Hu Jintao as less autonomous for the fact of his fleet of automobiles precisely because he can't go out and drive and be anonymous on the road. Um, yeah, uh, let me uh, just uh, start with uh, Dong Yue's question. That's a great question about local knowledge. In fact, um, in my longer paper, I actually have a whole section talking about local culture and local knowledge. You know, as anthropologists, that's a very sensitive topic, right? So, but I, I want to say that I don't want to give an impression that uh, the notion of local knowledge is so unproblematized as if there is this local knowledge untouched by the national and the global. And in fact, I'm trying to show is that any sort of so-called local knowledge is already transformed by uh, uh, this kind of global encounter and, and national forces. So, um, and, and also we have to look at the, the, the picture though, there is this question of power relation. Certain forms of knowledge somehow uh, gets to become global and universal. So in this context, the Western psych uh, psychotherapy, you know, knowledge becomes, appears as universal and global. But I, I talk about in the paper, if you trace the roots of psychotherapy, it's deeply cultured. It's local in a sense, you know, it has its local roots. Uh, but somehow in this process, this local roots and origin gets, gets kind of erased and lost and appears as a global, powerful, universal uh, uh, you know, set of knowledge versus all those other local knowledge. So but I'm trying to do is actually to deconstruct this uh, dichotomy uh, actually through the notion of this di that dialogic is how the local and global are always integrated. But certain forms of knowledge have the power to appear as, as uh, uh, universal. Um, and I think, well, I don't know how to begin with, but uh, uh, Wenxin raised a number of profound questions I don't even know how to begin to ad address. And also at the early stage of this research, uh, it is very hard to say, but I very much uh, appreciate those questions. Uh, I guess it's, uh, it would be interesting to see, you know, whether uh, as I 
uh, proceed with my research, whether the, the, the Chinese uh, therapist would uh, identify a more sort of a, a, a distinct Chinese psyche or whether the so-called Chinese psyche would become actually very much uh, similar to other psyche as we see. I, I, I don't know, that's a great puzzle. I think a lot of uh, Chinese psychologists are struggling with that. Um, but I want to give one example here. I think uh, this kind of therapeutic intervention uh, can be both empowering but also limiting. For example, the notion of depression, the diagnosis. Now before, maybe 10 years ago, the tech clinical notion of a depression, yi yu zhen, was largely absent. But now, people come to articulate their experience now through this notion of depression, particularly as they encounter this kind of psychological counseling and psychiatry. So it becomes a way of them to, uh, to articulate their experience. Now, on the one hand, it's profoundly empowering. Some people find a big relief that they finally have this category to explain to people that this is a real issue, a problem. On the other hand, um, it is... Um, it is very limiting because it already rules out other related experiences and, and possible articulation. Now everything is kind of funneled through this notion of depression. So um, anyway, leave it there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, I just very briefly to uh, respond to some of these uh, uh, questions. On the local knowledge, I actually want to go back to Levinson's trilogy. You know, in the first volume, he talked about uh, meaning versus vocabulary, no? Because uh, you certainly can produce meaning locally as much as you like, do whatever things you want. You see, I understand truth and democracy in my way, no? That's actually the meaning. Meaning is local, but vocabulary, psychoanalysis is never Chinese. It's actually some other people's, you know, vocabulary. So this is actually the, uh, I thought uh, your talk and Levinson actually suggested uh, this very you know, interesting you know, uh, thinking already in the 1960s, how to think about global discourses versus uh, uh, production of local meanings. Uh, I can only indirectly respond to uh, Wenxin and uh, Zhang Li's, um, uh, uh, her paper and Wenxin's uh, comments because I really feel that, uh, you know, these days, uh, um, uh, I certainly hope local people could actually have whatever they want. But it's actually not true, no? China was actually forced to get into revolution, no? To follow the Russian example. And now, willingly, probably also unconsciously, forced to take up the cars, to give up uh, bicycles. So this transition is actually something that is really interesting for us to look into. Because of the global condition of material development, there is this possibility for us to intervene. This is actually, I want to end uh, this on a very optimistic note, but I don't really think it's exactly created by local people. I thought we really have to see this double uh, process. On the one hand, you know, China's fast material development. In many ways, I think the development is actually a copy. I don't think you know, the development is actually our original historical development. I think it's basically a cultural borrowing. That's basically, you know, my, you know, after uh, Levinson's work, we can see China could only go on by adopting either Marxism now, Americanism. So, but on the other hand, on the other hand, I thought uh, because of the size and the material development now China presents to the world, it really presents also to us an uh, opportunity, no? Although, Kevin, you know, we have all these problems with uh, academic, uh, you know, uh, fragmented, uh, disciplinary, compartmentalized, uh, departmental problems. But on the other hand, I thought now, you know, if you work on Brazil or some other places, Japan, you know, many students in anthropology, if you work on Japan or Korea, you would really feel very difficult to make your voice heard. But in the case of China, this, this condition is here. I think we need really one of the things uh, uh, to respond to Tim's uh, talk. Uh, I don't really think it's exactly the time for us to talk about area studies or disciplines and so on and so forth and uh, ad hoc committees and so on. 
I thought one of the things we really need to do is exactly to, to, to change this habit. China is not a place. China is not a country. China is not a nation state. China is not a people. Uh, China is actually now has becoming really a signification for the contemporary world. China is a symbol, I would say. China is a sign. You know, if we can really understand this sign, we probably really a means by which we can understand the condition of life we live. That's basically what I feel the significance and the whole you know uh, uh, producing knowledge uh, conference uh, uh, means for me at least uh, for us. So how can we actually turn uh, really uh, uh, academic habit into some other directions? We don't really talk about China in terms of a nation state or a place, but rather in terms of a symbol, a copy, a fake copy probably in many ways in terms of material production. I thought this habit is, is on the one hand is actually a habit in China, but also on the other hand is a habit already, you know, a habit, a habit of our academic hearts. So that's, you know, uh, any of you last words? A mirage at your books. <laughs> no, so uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, why don't we continue the conversation outside.